Hello everybody, uh, it is I, Ryan. Uh, I got a quick update video here and my work schedule has shifted around a whole bunch. So if this video is short or a little messy, I apologize because stuff got changed around me last minute for my actual job job. So I'm trying to get this in a little quick while I can to get a video up to speak on time. So I uh, did some changes. <laughs> Not a lot, um, just some big changes to the actual setup of this here. So one of the probably the biggest changes that I did, I, uh, most of it's pretty much the same, is from Enhanced Backgrounds. Um, we got into the world of on stream this week. We did a lot of stuff on stream this week. Um, give us sparks notes what we're going to talk about this episode, right? Talk about updates to me to the book. I'm going to go into finishing. I finished all the spells for every class. <laughs> and I um, started working on a lot of the um, Oromon CR placements and where they should be in each of their tiers. And I got all the way up to one, like beyond one and halfway-ish through two. So, which is great. So, hopefully, this upcoming next part of the stream will be able to bang out more of those creatures. Once all those are placed, I can start actually going into making the creature stat blocks and evolutions and things. We can have fun with that. So, just finishing all this prelim early stuff of organization so that way people can actually like start playing the game with all the basic creatures in DD. Like, you don't need me to give you the evolutions of creatures for you to start playing this game with the cards that are at hand, so, which is pretty cool. All right. Um, new quick thing is if you're watching on YouTube, which is awesome if you are, if you're listening, you can totally listen to. Since there's no creatures, there's really no art to look at this episode, and it's mainly me talking about spells and evolutions of creatures, and talk about stat blocks of the creatures that already exist in Dungeons and Dragons. So you can certainly keep listening to whatever platform you're listening on, which is always great and appreciated, and I love seeing all the likes, comments, and things from people on all different platforms. So, um, without further ado, if you are on YouTube, or you're watching this, yep, on YouTube, I guess it's probably the spot you watch the video. Um, no, notice the layout's a lot different. I now have a new streaming layout, nothing too fancy. Um, but now you can see, so as people make donations to the cause and things via stream, via Patreon and things, I'll update that bar on top, which is the next Aramon art purchase. So that way you guys can feel like your donations are actually going towards a goal, which you can see up top there. Um, I randomly picked a day to have it end, I think. I had to be just the 20th of June, just a random day, really. There's really no, like, end date for it, but I'd like to get it in before the next art purchase. And then that way you guys can feel like the money you're donating is going to drawings for this project. And you can tell your friends, like, hey... My money, my donations for this went into making this book and project. And um, Viru, who shout out to you, Viru, if you're listening to this, um, has been amazing on stream. Um, so has Katie and other people that have stopped by the stream to talk. Katie, Matt, um, Torva, all you guys have been stopping by talking on stream. It's great for me. Helps me be able to feed ideas off of you guys and helps me orient myself a little better too when it comes to building and working on things. Um, so if you also donate, I'll start to make the donation page on the introductory note for people to see where they donated or just have your name be in the book. So you can tell your friends like, hey, when this book finally gets released, look at that name right there in the introductory note. That's my name. I helped with that project. So if you want that and want to have that feature to brag to your friends about this before you bring it to the table to play with them, it'll help get you some extra, you know, a little bit of bed betterness with your friends. Put your little edge up, you know. Anyway, let's get going. Um, I should find a lot of stuff in the book. So I in the enhanced background section, we talked about backgrounds like episode, was it two or one or two, where I talked about the beginnings with the backgrounds and things. I wanted to give Pirate a little more, right? So Pirate originally had Water Breathing as its deck bonus, which gives a, anything with a deck bonus gets a plus two to all attack rolls of cards of that creature type, rarity, or ability, etc. Right, you have Criminal with Undead, you have an Entertainer, they have a Humanoid, if they play that, they get the Humanoids get a bonus, Guild Artisans, Constructs, etc. Pirates are going to have Water Breathing. Um, and this came up as a discussion because as we went through creatures, the question came, uh, what do you do about Water Breathing creatures on land, right? If this game is supposed to be like an adaptation, Sort of on the creatures of Pokemon, or sort of on the creatures in D&D, kind of Yu-Gi-Oh, kind of a bunch of stuff, right? Um, what should happen with creatures that live on the water that are summoned on land? Do they flop around like a Magikarp on land in Pokemon? Do they stay alive on land like the water Pokemon do in Pokemon? Or how should they work? So ultimately we decided that, and I will put, uh, scroll down quickly to the frequently asked questions because they added that in there. Um, I, because I figured those come up. Can water breathing Aramon breathe on land? That's the frequently asked question section so people know when they get the book, right? Um, in this world, since the aura flows through all things, um, in this world, the aura flows through all things. So as thus, since they are not in their optimal water environment, they get a disadvantage to attack rolls to hit while on land. I think that's fair, right? If I was to put an octopus on land, it can still fight me. It can still attack and thrash and do all that stuff, but it's going to attack with um, disadvantage. It's not going to attack by hit normal because now it's out in the water. So I think that's a fair thing. Um, so I wanted to add a pirate's table in the enhanced backgrounds, which shifted a bunch of paragraphs around, so I had to reformat a bunch of things. But so now water, so pirates are going to get water breathing, parentheses, also no disadvantage when fighting on land. I think that's pretty self-explanatory, right? So if they're with a water breathing creature, you also have no disadvantage when fighting on land if you're a pirate. So that gives pirates a little bit of a better thing than just a plus two to their water breathing creatures. Their water breathing creatures also don't suffer disadvantage on land, but they don't actually, there's not a lot of things that 
water breathe and they're not like the strongest things in the game either so that's why i kind of felt to help them out a little bit with that so and obviously if that's too broken i'll just go back to water breathing normally and we'll forget about that but i wanted to give a little bit of extra buff to that because water breathing compared to just playing with beasts dragons celestials there's not too many water breathing things right some things could be breathing on both and not have the water breathing ability so obviously once people start to play this and i get feedback on how the game looks and functions and i'll definitely be able to figure out okay what's broken what's not all right so going on um that, so that's something changed the next huge thing i changed um and i'm waiting to hear back from my discord too on this because i just kind of posed the question before i started recording so next episode this might be different but is i made each class only be able to cast now they finish all the spells right and i looked at the list i'm like whoa so i made it so now uh, for example i read the power class one to you going down the class path of going down the class path of power allows you to dominate over your foes through the use of pure damage to be able to knock out their Oromon faster than any other class. This playstyle is good for players that like to hit things very hard and quite successfully. Choosing this pathway allows you to add your proficiency bonus to hit on power spells. Due to being so power focused, there is no time to learn celestial or mystic spells, and as such, you may not cast spells outside of your class path. Parentheses besides Wish. Spoiler, as you see right there, uh, every class is going to have access to Wish because I feel that it could be fun and just. Such a broken spell in Dungeons and Dragons. I know I have a thing in Dungeons and Dragons can't learn Wish, but um, I didn't really want to just limit it to Celestial or, or um, Mystic and not give it to Power. And I didn't want to just give it to one of the three. If you guys think I should just, let me know down below because I'm totally open to just making it be just a Mystic or just a Celestial thing. But I wanted to give every class the option to be able to cast Wish. And what I was thinking too is once I actually get the cards made, right? The cards printed, made. Because once we're done with this, I can start making more cards for people to see all the different art on and read stats and stuff and be able to actually see more of the cards besides just badgering. <laughs> you guys have seen before. Um, this way, when I make all the spell cards, yep, that's going to be a thing too. Uh, um, I can make their backgrounds instead of like purple, like all the Oromon creatures, right? I can make them either be red, yellow, or blue corresponding to their spell class. Because I think that would just be the easiest Right, that'll just be the easiest play to just make them be color focused and then be like, all right, you can crack open a pack at home. All right, they get a red card. I'm a power thing. I can use it. Instead of being like, well, can I use this spell? Can I use this spell? Do I get disadvantage? Do I subtract my proficiency mod from it? The problem with that too, if you're like, why, why this change? Um, it used to be, right? The rod of the text used to be, or the old version of the text used to be that the power spells, right, for power was, all right, proficiency bonus. Celestial so normal and then mystic spells, you have your dis you you subtract your proficiency. Right. Problem with that is a lot of spells such as celestial are mainly utility. So what does that mean as far as you being able to cast them or not? Can you do it? Can you not? And then I would change it to say you can you can't cast any spells unless they deal damage or ability checks from another school. And then I was like, well, that's not good either. But I simply just made it be, all right, your power, cast your red power spell cards, great. And wish, which will probably be just like a striped red, blue, yellow color. So every class can use it, right? Like a dual class. So there's that. And I think that's the best way to explain it. Same thing for Mystic, same thing for Celestia. I just made it so each one can only cast their own. Because I feel like it would be so much easier for new players. Especially when you get all the, expose all these cards and you're like, what are these? And you're like, all right, I drew a card. Is it red? Okay, it's a red power spell. Easy. Uh, fireball? Got it. Bam. Did it. Discard. Graveyard. Cool. All right. With that being said, that was the biggest change, I think, was those two things. Um, other things were just spelling grammar mistakes went through again. If you guys see anything as spelling grammars, please, on the Discord, DM me, let me know. Be like, hey, yo, listen, underneath, so you think you can hide, da 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 da, da. If you see a lot of stuff that, like, when you look at the um, links down below, check out the thing, let me know. All right, so I think I've done enough with that. Um, yeah, also, if you ever want to check out my stream, I always let Discord know about when, I'm, when I go live with things. So if you're ever free and you just want to hop in to let me know and talk about the project and we work on stuff together, that's always appreciated. Um, another thing is I'm debating on potentially... Um, oh, it's, yeah, it's shifted some stuff around. I haven't gone through and looked at it to see if everything's shifted yet, but as you can tell, I finished the list. Yay! I did six, seven, eight, nine last week and a bunch of creature organization. I feel like I did really good on the stream last week. So um, that being said, let's get into spells. Um, I want to make sure that I fix the spells here. Um, I cast spells or channel through the Oromon. By doing this, the Oromon is able to fight alongside the Oromon and can even channel their spells through the Oromon as long as it's within their class path. Yep, as long as, as long as it's within their class path. Bam, perfect. So that another reinforcement. You can only cast spells as long as they're in your class path, like the power spells, the celestial spells, and the mystic spells. So... Um, 
Again, the spells are organized by their spells levels as they would be Dungeons and Dragons, but when first acquired, they start at spell level 1 and need to be fused to go up in spell level. If a spell or cantrip improves with you casting at a higher level, instead of a player level, it is the spell's own level instead. Cast on Aramon, their weapon attacks, or their melee arranged weapons when appropriate. So, uh, Right, because some things are evolving just like, if I'm making a slashing attack with a sword or something, with a smite attack, and then I, I can cast that through my creature to smite through their claws or smite through their teeth or whatever it be. Right, so that's where that comes in. Uh, for example, power, right, is you use your strength mod whenever a spell refers to your spellcasting ability. In addition, you use your strength mod when setting this saving throw for DC for a power spell you cast and when making attack rolls. Basically, what it is is your spell set DC is 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your strength mod. Easy, right? Proficiency bonus is 2, strength mod is 2, 8 plus 2 plus 2 is 12. So your spell save DC is 12. Your spell attack modifier is your proficiency bonus plus your strength mod of 2 plus 2 would be 4. Easy. Get a plus 40 or spell attack modifier, etc. Well, okay. <sighs> now they got that out of the way of those changes and updates that I made. Um, hopefully it'll be a little clearer for new players when people get into the game. Like, Alright, I'm a power spell. Here's my list of stuff I can learn. I'm mystic. Here's my list, etc. So, yeah. I'm going to go through some of the spells quick. I won't go through them all, but... Because um, we've already talked about a lot of them primarily. And then I will hopefully be able to get on to creatures, which is a lot of stuff I worked on with creatures. And... CR2 is being a little bit of a pain with creatures, but we'll get to that and later on in a couple of minutes here. All right, finishing up here for the spells, and then we'll be done with spells. I can focus on creatures for this, which I think most of you guys are here to see, right? The unique creatures that I'm adding to the game, uh, where they should fall in terms of power level, things like that, I think is what everyone's excited to see. All right, uh, go through spells, quick blade barrier. Around six level spells. I won't go through them all, like I've said before. If something was like an interesting one that I remember talking about, Blade Barrier, you create a vertical wall of whirling razor-sharp blades made of magical energy. Obviously, blades, attack power, stuff like that. Uh, failed save, creature takes 60-10 slashing when they enter the wall's area the first time on their turn. Uh, basically, yeah, if they want to like, go through the wall, they have to take 60-10 slashing. And obviously, if a spell involves slashing, bludgeoning, piercing, that's more of a power-damaging spell. If it's an element, it's more likely a mystic spell to be pretty easy, right? Uh, let's see, Contingency. A lot of them had like a find the path kind of spell. It's a great way to explain what I mean by that. Let's see, find the path. Uh, this spell allows you to find the shortest, most direct physical route to a specific fixed location that you're familiar with. Basically, it just lets you find the way if you're lost. Okay. Um, a lot of, like, each class had a lot of, like, a weird special thing like that where it was like, okay, find the path if you get lost. Other ones are like, okay, we're going to go to another plane of existence or send the bad guy to another plane of existence. And I was like, okay. Uh, move Earth, obviously you make Earth shoot up and you make a box around it. Um, transport via plants, I felt was a power spell. Um, and here's why, right? You're kind of like, what? Um, transport between plants here. The spell creates a magical link between a large or larger inanimate plant within range and another plant at any distance on the same plane of existence. You may have seen or touched the distance point at least once before. For the duration, any creatures can step into the target plane, plant and exit. So, basically, right, we're about sneaking around, we're about giving our Armands advantages from sneak attacks, things like that, especially if they have a high strength mod, which is all about power, right? Uh, so, naturally, I figured, like, the move between plants is the best way to do that. Uh, Globe of Invulnerability, too, I know I, that one is, let's see. Uh, an immobile, faintly shimmering barrier springs into existence in a 10-foot radius around you and remains the duration, right? Something targets you, protects you, and that's usually a power spell. Pretty plain explanatory. A uh, wall of thorns is simply piercing damage from plants. Uh, okay, so 7th level spell. 7th level was really weird. Now, I will admit, I've been a DM for at least 10 to 11 years of doing this. Um, and... I've not had players, I've had players get there and get high level spells, but like, I wasn't the most familiar with them compared to things like Firebolt, Chill Touch, Eldritch Blast, right? The, the basic early game stuff. So, seeing the high level spells was a real interesting time. Like, we have things like Etherealness, Plane Shift, Sequester, and I was like, I don't know what these are. So, let me see, go to 7th level. Etherealness just basically makes you, um... Seven, the border region of the ethereal plane. A lot of this stuff involved like plane travel and going between planes, and I'm like, okay, I guess. <laughs> sure. Um, right, well, in the ethereal plane, you can only affect or affect by other creatures on that plane. Creatures that are in the ethereal plane can't perceive you and interact with you, which seemed like a protection thing, right? For just you. So I was like, that's definitely a power thing. 
uh, sequester. Just, uh, one of them evolves some weird stuff too. Uh, creature objects can be hidden away, safe from detection. Yeah, so basically, lets you guarantee hide things, which sounded like a good rogue power air quotes thing. Transport, teleport, obviously, just get to new locations to attack people, pretty easy. Project image, all that. Uh, okay, eighth level. Uh, let's see what's the one to talk about here. Oh, the earthquake I thought was pretty cool. Like you slam on the ground and you make like an earthquake appear. That seemed pretty self-explanatory. Mind blank being able to erase people's minds. Oh no, sorry. Mind blank I think erases your own mind for the time being, so that nobody can read it. Let me see. Uh, until the spell ends, one willing creature you touch is immune to psychic damage. Any effect that would sense its motion or read its thoughts, divinations, um, spells, and the charm condition. So it basically prevents people from sensing you at all. Yep, or gain information for the target. So all that's really good to help just stop people from giving out information. Uh, and of course, power word, stun. Oh man, power word. Well, that's got to go into power class, obviously. Um, and that was power word, stun. There's other power words as well that come in later, like heal and kill. But stun, I think, was a good one for power, just being able to stun something. And if the target has 150 points or fewer, it is stunned. Well, that's pretty good, because most creatures don't have a lot of hit points, but 150 is still pretty sizable. So knocking a creature down a bit and then just stunning to get a free turn for your other players to hit it sounds pretty good. Uh, and then ninth level was some of the higher level stuff here with Foresight, Power Word, Kill. Like, again, Power Word, Kill is here, right? So Power Word, Kill. Uh, you utter a word of power that can compel one creature you can see within range to die instantly. Chosen your creature has 100 hit points or fewer, it dies. Otherwise, it has no effect. I figured, all right. That's the that's the crown jewel of the power class, right? That's the best spell where it's like, what you want ultimate power? You want to take out something? Fine. Go over to it. You have less than hundred points. Bam, you're dead instantly. Pretty good. That's why spells are semi limited in this. <laughs> Just being able to go up to your enemy's creature and being like, all right, dead. Pretty good. Pretty good indeed. And a range of sixty feet. You don't even have to go over and like touch it or point at it. You know, you can point at it for 60 feet and be like, you and just take it out. Yeah. Take notes, DM. That's a pretty good uh, spell to use against your creature. See, it's great now. Because you can obviously summon one big thing to fight your players, and they have to use their four creatures. And as long as your big thing is has multi-attack, oh, oh, it can go like take out a bunch, it can hit a bunch of things. It'd be great. See, so for DMs and players, this game's pretty cool. So, and if it, whenever it gets knocked out or dies, even if your player rolls a D100, if everybody rolls the right number to meet its threshold, they could get a copy of that, too. If within reason, right? If the bad guy teleports away, then that doesn't happen, but yeah. But otherwise, pretty cool. Um, and obviously everything is Wish, right? I want to give them all Wish. Again, please let me know down below your thoughts on Wish, if you think Wish should be a thing, if it shouldn't. Um, for every class, as you see, ninth level, they all get Wish, because, you know, I wanted to make it one spell that unites them all. And that's Wish, right? If you have one thing that you want every player to be able to have access to when they play. And granted, some players may abuse the Wish spell. Obviously, it has the Wish has its own ruling where you have a chance where it never casts again, and that spell will dissipate and turn to ash in your hand. DMs can have freedom to describe however they'd like. But, but yeah. So Wish could be an interesting way to get a copy of like a high-level card you need. There might be a, like a legendary item called like the Golden Sleeve, which, makes it, which acts as a morphing of any card you want for fusion purposes. Be pretty cool right so uh, i've always been thinking about items on the back seat right trying to plan out cool items that could be introduced in this game for players to use because this is a entire different game mode right you're not attacking with swords bows and arrows you're using your creatures to fight with and so ultimately being able to get items to help with that is really really useful so all right i think we're done with the power class oh time stop i guess i'll explain time stop that one time stop seemed really cool i liked this one i thought this was a good power spell for sure you briefly stop the flow of time for everyone but yourself Oh, that's, that just sounds like a power spell. No time passes for other creatures while you take 1d4 plus 1 turns in a row, during which you can use actions and move as normal. The spell ends if one of the actions you use during the period or any effect that you create during this period affects a creature other than you or an object being worn or carried by someone other than you. In addition, the spell ends if you move to a place more than a thousand feet from the location where you casted it. So, this can allow a quick getaway. This can allow you yourself to hide to get surprise attack on somebody this could allow you to potentially set up a trap in two turns so that when it comes back and the enemy is still running at you you then just pull a rope that's hanging out and the chandelier maybe falls on them after you move it over move the rope over for your actions and then that way you just take out the enemy there's a lot of a lot of a lot of ways you can have fun with this spell that seemed like a good time like power spell because it's just you right it's not the team for celestial and it's not causing chaos to everybody 
It's just you that's causing time to stop for everybody else. So then you can do other things. So that's power in a nutshell. And of course, right, with this, to, to reiterate things, with this again, obviously there's a lot more early game stuff in D&D than there's later stuff. So once I get over the early game hump of doing these creatures, of like making these spells laid out like we did, next thing's going to be the creatures. A lot of creatures early game, <laughs> getting those things laid out. Then it will come to laying out the creatures, getting them updated, getting art for them all and things like that. So that's why I'm starting early to get art before I'm even really there. That's why you've seen the five things if you haven't seen them already. They're up on the Reddit and or they're in the Discord, which you can check out the link down below or see spinning up above my head if you're on youtube you can see all the different things spinning by me now um yeah so that's why i'm trying to get art early if at any point anybody says to me hey can i draw you anything for the project let me know and i will definitely tell you what i need to be part of the project and you will be cited just like um goku king was here and um iori is on all the creatures that she's gotten and i bought some art too so i include the artist in that once i buy the rights to use it for commercial use right so at any point you say, hey, can I donate, or, or I know of an artist that would like to donate to your cause, definitely let me know, and I'll, we have a lot of drawing, guys, a lot of things that need to get done on the drawing aspect, even if you don't think if you're the best artist and you want to, like, reach out to me to see if you can have some stuff put in from you, if, like, if I think it's good enough and if it should be in it, like, obviously, I think it could be great to include, right, because then you can make your mark in a game mode that you can play with your friends and be like, listen, my art's surrounded by all these other good artists and things, so, and I've made my own fair share of little drawings here and there as creatures to put in that you'll see. At some point, I'm going to get to them. So I'm not a good artist either, believe me. So, um, but yeah, if you're ever interested in any artists that would be like to get in, um, I prefer to be digital, obviously, um, so I can incorporate them in and digitally be able to use them. I suppose it's something that's drawn. So even if it's like Microsoft Paint and you just draw a quick sketch and you're like, hey, what do you think of this? And I just get my thoughts. It could be, could be cool. Something we could definitely work on. Anyway, uh, getting Celestial quick. And once it finishes up, they'll finish up the creatures, like I've said. So Celestial, uh, Arcane Gates, so let's go Circle of Death. That was a fun one to read about. That was like, oh, this is a, this is a Celestial for sure. Okay. Circle of Death. A sphere of negative energy ripples out in a 60-foot radius sphere from a point within range. Each creature in the area must make a con saving throw. A target takes 8d6 necrotic damage on a failed save or half so on a successful one. I wanted to give um, Celestial some form of damage, so I figured if anything's necrotic or radiant, I'll give it to him because that, that sounds like it should be something that they should have power over, right? Life and death. So the sphere of neg negative energy comes down to 60 foot radius from a point within range. Each creature in the area is like a con saving throw, otherwise they take 8d6. Right, because we talked about with Celestial early on, they have abilities that later on in your class path, right, you unlock that lets you be able to do necrotic or radiant damage right like a holy angel or a death angel whatever you want to call yourself at that point so um that's where now that we're in six level and higher spells we have stuff that can be radiant or necrotic damage so um jumanji's instant summons why do i have this here touch an object within 10 feet is dimension six feet the spell leaves an invisible mark on the surface invisibly inscribes the name on the item on the sphere you use as the material components. Each time you cast this spell, you must use a different uh, sapphire. Sorry, sapphire, not sphere. At any time, therefore, you can use your action to speak the item's name and crush the sapphire, and the item teleports to your hand. So, pretty cool, right? So, if you're like, I need to get the key to escape or whatever, and my buddy's holding on the key, but he got down in the fight and he's telling us to go on without him, I could smash the sapphire and the key's now in my hand, and we can unlock the door and get out of there before the dragon eats us. That'd be neglectively ran in to attack us and got hit with so all right moving on here i think that looks better there yeah just sliding some stuff around sorry i recently made the background like on stream so it's not the, the cleanest layout yet so it's just a working part but all good All right. Okay, so continuing on here. Sorry, I hit something and it just slid. Okay, better, better. All right. Uh, flesh to stone, you obviously turn flesh to stone with paralysis. What better way to not take damage than to just paralyze the enemy? Uh, um, heal. Is heal the one? One of them is a really strong one that we might have to... Uh, oh! That's what I've also changed. Yeah, I I um I fixed some of Celestial stuff now that we're talking about it. Yeah, remember how Celestial had the ability, um we're going to it right now. Uh 
Uh, healing Purge. Is this the one? You may have demonstrated your dedication. Okay, the hour rewards you with the ability of Healing Purge. Once during your short rest, you may cause your healing spell to heal twice the amount rolled. That's what I changed to. A rolled, not the amount healed. So, because of spells like this, I think it's heal. Is it heal? Let me see. Yeah. Here's a creature, as you can see, with a range. A surge of positive energy washes over the creature, causing it to regain 70 hit points. Also ends blindness, deafness, or any disease affecting the target. Um, so, what that means is you cannot use Healing Purge with that. So you cannot heal your thing 140 health one time. Um, so, for example, once during your short rest, you may cause your healing spell to heal twice the amount rolled. You may not use this with Spectral Armor or a spell that requires no dice roll to heal. This effect causes you to glow a yellow aura upon being used. So, basically, right, you have to have a spell that requires you to roll to heal. You can't just heal something 140 health. As fun as that sounds at being a level 14, uh, the other thing is thine only is thine weapon is what really made me decide, uh, yeah, let's, let's fix that. So at level 18, you've mastered the arts of healing and have unlocked healing, your healing abilities against your enemies. Once per long rest, your body glows a demonic black aura instead of a holy yellow and activates this ability. You may cause the use of healing, press the restoration spells, right, to instead deal that much damage to an enemy in the form of necrosis or radiant damage. This may be used in conjunction with Healing Purge, as well as the conjunction with Spectral Armor. It will cause the enemy to lose health points instead of healing points. Because at that point, you're level 18. Right? You're end game. At that point, if you want to deal... You want to use Healing Purge, it has to be a roll. right? So if you heal somebody 35 from rolling, then you could double it to 70 and then deal that damage to an enemy. I think, you know, dealing 140 damage to somebody, that's, that's a little much, right? So... Uh, yeah, especially even end game one action dealing 140 damage. Yeah, so that's where that had to be a little adjusted, and I'm sure all of the, uh, these other class will have to be adjusted at some point. So somebody brought that up to me on stream when I was telling them about it. They were like, that thing heals. I was like, mm, no, you're right. That's that's really strong. So that's been fixed as well. I don't know how many people have looked at the book much, but since, but yes, so that's been changed. Um, Thing I would Celestial, right? Because uh, they heal. Maybe think of the Hero's Feast. You basically make a nine course meal for people. Some of these high level spells are pretty cool. Making a nine course meal, making a mansion for people to live in. That's coming. Yeah, Mordekainen's Magnificent Mansion. You literally build a mansion with like servants and stuff to take care of the team. And I'm like, what? <laughs> it just seemed really good. Um, Planner Ally. That's where you like ask a god for uh, opinions and thoughts. True Sing. You get True Sight. Wind Walk. Walk on Wind. Word of Recall. Memory stuff. A uh, finger of death I gave Celestial as well because it was a single necrotic thing. Let me see if I can find finger of death. That is level seven. Finger of death. Here we go. You send negative energy, causing a creature that you can see within range severe searing pain. Target must take a con saving throw, taking 78 plus 30 necrotic damage, and a failed save for half as much on a successful one. Humanite killed by the spell rise at the start of your next turn as a zombie. That is permanent until your command following your verbal orders at best of its ability. High level spells. High level spells unless we're like, okay. End game. If you kill a enemy or a mom with this. They go to the graveyard. They then rise up as a spectral zombie. Alright. You have an extra zombie helping you fight somebody. At the end game, if the enemy is like a dragon that's breathing fire and slashing and cutting at you. Or like an experiment. Or a or, or, or something. Then you know. Obviously it doesn't matter too much. Uh, experiment or mine, what are those? Um, currently in the works. I found a lot of art online I can use that uh, is like a fusion of two creatures. So that'll be a special a special preview for future. So you might take, for example, like uh, a good example is like an otter and a blue dragon. And you fuse them together to make an otter dragon, as an example. And there's art for that, which looks really cool. So uh people listening if you want to see that let me know and i'll drop in the discord so uh, but those will obviously come later those will each have tiers ranks those can only be summoned if you fuse to if you like have a creature out and you release it and you discard a card from your hand to then be able to summon the uh the fusion so uh it's a big sacrifice and you have to make sure that you discard in addition to that the right one to then be able to fuse and bring out the creature from your hand as an experiment i should say uh, so, I have to find the right word if I want to call it an experiment um, Oromon or a stitched Oromon. It's just we use fusion already for another mechanic, so I don't want to call it like a fused Oromon. So, uh, it's obviously stuff that work, a little preview for future stuff. Anyway, uh, continuing on, right? 
Uh, Celestial, uh, we were up here. Finger of Death just deals damage. Necrotic damage. That's it. Um, Horse Cage drops from the Cage. Marty Kind's Magnificent Mansion. You build a mansion. Regenerate. Uh, regenerate. Regenerate does. And obviously, Resurrection, you come back alive. Uh, yeah, you touch a creature, healing ability, target regains 48 plus 15 hit points. All right, so that's rolling, right? That's a rolling ability. For the duration, the target regains one hit point at the start of each of its turns. So, targets severed body membranes. Oh, the targets severed body membranes, fingers, legs, tail, and so on. The targets severed body members, fingers, legs, tails, and so on. If any are restored after two minutes, if you have severe part in a hold up to the stump, the spell instantly causes limb to knit to this. Yeah. So you're basically able to retach missing pieces with it, which is pretty cool. Uh, 48 plus 15. At max, that's 47. Right? 4 times 8 is 32. Plus 15 is 47. So at max, that's 47 healing, which it doubled a little more than 90, 94 ish. So that could be pretty good, obviously. But that's obviously if you roll max, and that's a rolling, right? Versus just, bam, heal 70. And then, oh, 140 damage. No. <laughs> Let's not break the game too much. Um, some lacrum is interesting. You make a clone of yourself, but like has to grow, and then eventually it becomes like your size within a certain time period. And if you die, you can put your body and soul into your simulacrum that looks like you and continue to live and breathe, which is crazy. Um, Control Weathers, Clone is like Simulacrum in a way. Uh, feeble Mind, Holy Aura is an aura, an aura around you that heals. Let me see Holy Aura. Divine Light washes out from your coalescence and soft race three feet around you. Creatures of your choice in the radius, you cast a spell. The, 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 have advantage on all saving throws and other creatures have disadvantage on attack rolls against them until the spell ends. So not just you, but anybody else in your aura, which is very strong. Initially, when the Fiend or Undead hits an effective creature with a melee attack, the aura flashes with bright light. The attacker must succeed on a constant throw or be blinded. And like a great celestial spell, right? So, uh, next on the list. Uh, sunburst is like radiant holy damage from the sky in the form of like the sun coming down. 12d6 radiant damage and is blinded for one minute. In a 60 foot radius, sounds like a good celestial thing, right? You call on the sun. Telepathy, you understand people through their mind. Astral projection, you go to the astral plane. You all can travel distances. Uh, mass heal, I think, empowered heal, like the two in true resurrection. Bring somebody back alive. I'm going to look at the last heal ones quick so we can talk about mass heal and powered heal real quick. Mass heal. Okay, I'm back. Sorry, I had a little disruption, but that's why recording's nice, because I can do a bunch of editing. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, so we were just basically saying, right, you can store up to 700 hit points as you choose. That's not a roll, so you can't double it and heal 1,400 hit points to basically everything that's out on your guys' team and be like, ha, JK, good luck trying to hit us. So, that's where those come into play, right? The spell's no effect on dead or construct, so obviously it depends on what you're healing, but um, creatures healed by the spell are also cured of any disease and any effects making them blind or deaf and, and all that. So, the, anti the ultimate anti-mystic spell, right? Because mystic's all about causing chaos, blinding, deafening, with death and... Um, AOE effects and all that. So, ultimately, you can't double that, right? So, that's why that, that's in there. Because as they heal more, they had more healing effects. Uh, and then, what was the other one I was going to look at? There was that one, Mass Heal, and Powered Heal was the other one. Power Word Heal. Powered Heal. Is that a thing? I'm not seeing that on my list now. Have I just been... Oh, there's Powered Heal. Da, 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 on the bottom. Okay. Powered Heal. A wave of healing energy washes over the creature you touch. The target regains all of its hit points. If the creature is charmed, frightened, paralyzed, or stunned, the condition ends. If the creature is prone, it can use this reaction to stand up. This spells no effect on undead or construct, right? So, obviously, this one doesn't even heal. This just, bam, we got full health. Okay, cool. Ninth level spell. The highest level spells in the game. Ninth level. You want to bring your creature, your aura mod back to full health? Fine. Sure. I think you should have that power to do that when you're at ninth level ultimate high level healing spell, right? I think that's fair. So, all right. Moving on to the last part, Mystics here. Uh, Mystics just had a lot of damage stuff. Chain Lightning, Disintegrate. Um, magic Jar is really weird. 
Let me see if actually did I not remove mag I think magic jar actually got fixed to imprisonment. You read magic jar. Oh no no no. Your soul leaves, goes into a jar. Did I attempt to possess any humanoid? Yes, you basically like can use your soul to take over other people. Pretty crazy. A mass suggestion getting people to do what you say. Sounds like a good thing. Sunbeam, obviously dealing damage from the sun. Uh, oh, uh, Odo's Irresistible Dance was certainly a spell I was like, what? And then I read it and I was like, oh, okay, yeah. That's a 6th level spell. Odo's Irresistible Dance. Alright. This is a 30 feet 1 action. Choose one creature that you can see within range. The target begins a comic dance in place, shuffling, tapping its feet, and capping for the duration. Creatures that can't be charmed are immune to the spell. A dancing creature must use all of its movement to dance, without leaving its space, and has disadvantage on dexterity saving throws and attack rolls. While a target is affected by the spells, so a disadvantage on attack rolls is huge, right? While a target is affected by the spell, other creatures have advantage on rolls against it. As an action, a dancing creature can make a wisdom saving throw to regain control of itself on a successful save. The spell ends. But the creature has to use as an action. So it eats up at least one action from the enemy creature. And if they're at the end of the turn order and you're first and you do this, then all of your other people get advantage on hitting him. Very good spell. Very strong. Unsuccessful save, the spell ends. Okay, yeah. So basically just, you know, pretty straightforward stuff. Um, but it was just interesting. I was like, oh, you make somebody dance. All right. Fun ideas, making all these ancient creatures in this book of Monster Manual that I've been looking at. You know, just dancing, having a fun old time. You know, it was great. It's great. Uh, delayed Blast Fireball, I thought was an interesting one as well. I wanted to talk about for half a little, quick little minute here. A beam of yellow light flashes from your pointy finger, then condenses to linger at a chosen point within range as a glowing bead. Within When the spell ends, either... Because your concentration is broken, or because you decided to end it, the bead blossoms with a low roar into an explosion of flames that spreads around corners. Each creature in a 20-foot radius sphere centered on a point must make a dexterity saving throw. A creature takes fire damage equal to the total accumulated damage, and a failed save for half as much unsuccessful. The spell's base damage is 12d6. If at the end of your turn the bead is not yet detonated, the damage increases by 1d6. So you can keep it there, Hold it there, and then as the turns go by, if nobody, if you didn't detonate it for the spell ending because your concentration is broken or because you decided to end it, it just builds up damage, right? If the glowing bead is touched before the interval has expired, a creature touching it must make a dexterity saving throw. On a failed save, the spell immediately ends. Causing the bead to erupt in flame, a successful save, the creature can throw the bead up to 40 feet. When it strikes a creature or a solid object, the spell ends and the bead explodes. So, yeah. If you make a successful save against the bead, you can grab it quick and throw it. And then when it flies and hits something, then it explodes. Think of it almost like a bullet or a bomb. It's kind of how I pictured it, right? Like a little mine in the ground you can just place down that's glowing. Or perhaps you pull back on a bone arrow and shoot it or something. I don't know. You got a little fun with it. But when it strikes a creature style object, the spell ends and the bead explodes. The fire damage object in the area ignites flammable objects that aren't being worn or carried. Talk about like a mini cannonball, right? I know it's a delayed fire blast, but... It seemed like a very interesting spell I'd never really even heard about until I started looking into this. Reverse gravity, pretty cool. Maybe people float up in the air. <laughs> Firestorm, which is like a bunch of flames coming down. Uh, Mirror's Arcane. Is this the wall one? One of them had like a rainbow wall effect that was pretty, pretty crazy. I think that might be later. Prismatic wall, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Mirror's Arcane at 7th level. Illusion. Uh, make terrain up to one mile, look, sound, smell, and even feel like some sort of terrain. Yeah, you just basically make it look like a different terrain. Hills, swamps, all those changes. So if something gets benefit in a certain area, and now no longer gets benefit in that area because the thing changed or whatever. So, pretty interesting. Uh, eighth level, demi-plane, you just get to go to different planes of existence. Eighth level was the seventh we're known for doing all that, I guess. Dominate monster, you control a monster pretty much, and uh, saves and checks, then they get free. Incendiary cloud, you make a cloud of toxic gas, pretty cool. Maze, you actually send somebody to like, like their own virtual maze of like, like energy of their mind or something. If they're, but if they're a minotaur or, what's the other one? If they're a minotaur or a, oh, what is it? 
Minotaur or a Gorestro demon, they automatically succeed on a check of trying to get out of the maze. Every turn they make a DC 20 intelligence check. And I don't know if you know much about D&D, but not many things have a super high intelligence. Especially if it's like a wild animal. So, that might be a little hard for them, right? So, what else? Um, tsunami, obviously, it was just a wave of water coming in. Imprisonment at ninth level. Basically traps somebody in like an unleavable area of existence. It's like a demiplane. Meteor Swarm, one of the strongest fire damaging spells in the game. Storm of Vengeance was like a thundery storm. I'll read you guys Meteor Swarm. That's like a kind of known spell, right? People are afraid of it. Uh, blazing orbs of fire plummet to the ground at four different points you can see within range. Each creature in a 40 foot radius. Sphere centered on each point you choose must make a dexterity saving throw. The sphere spreads around corners. The creature takes 20 d6 fire damage and 20 d6 bludgeoning damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. A creature in the area of more than one fiery burst is affected only once. Yeah, so you can't like keep doubling dipping, but that's 40 d6 worth of damage. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's quite strong. Mm-hmm, yep. Uh, and then Weird just does interesting things to the person. I'll read Weird quick, because I always forget what that does. Um, weird. Drawing on the deepest spheres. Oh, that's right. You create illusionary creatures in the mines visible only for them to see. Um, on a failed save, creature becomes frightened for the duration. Yeah, you just frighten somebody. At the end of each of the frightened creatures' turn, it makes a wisdom saving throw. It takes 4d10 psychic damage. You basically, like, crash their psyche by killing them with nightmares, then they wouldn't normally see all right oh spells are done spells are in so like i said we kind of went in limited them to say all right your power you had access to these celestial these and mystic these that way if you're in a play group everyone can feel like that they're doing something special of their role before it was like all right yeah i'm playing i'm gonna cast a spell from here yeah i'll do this normally and all right i'll have a minus roll on that but i'll play every spell in my deck and then that came down to the best spell of all time in D&D being in everybody's deck. And once people figure that out, then it's like, all right, I want to just play the super strong spells. All right, we'll heal everybody 700 health. We'll heal our, deal a little 40 D6 to everybody. And for power, we might do something where it's like, all right, and we'll just stop time so that I can cast a bunch of those actions and get them ready. Or powered kill, I'll just instantly kill something. Yeah, ready? So people's decks end game could literally consist of powered kill, mass heal, and like meteor swarm. And wish. If they had access to all the spells. Instantly kill something. Instantly heal everybody. 700 to spread across. And instantly deal like 20 d6 to targets of AoE. So once you hear all that laid out. Hopefully you guys will agree with me that yeah. Limiting each one to their own special stuff is probably <laughs> for the best. That's why I gave Celestial some damaging stuff. Because right? they're only limited to their spells. But some of their spells deal damage. But they're mostly supportive roles. So alright. Done with those. I know that was quite a bit. Alright. Creature time. We got through 0, 1, 8, then 1, 4th last time. This time we're on to the 1 half, 1, and then 2. I'm halfway through. So, 1 half creatures, right? So we got, uh, let's see here. No, I want this one. Okay. So we're on the 0.5, I believe. I'm going to scroll down. I've also been trying to update again, like I said, the um, Update log on the bottom, the change logs, so people can see each date what's been made. So yeah, I'm going to talk about half and one, and then part of two. Plan. I'll do two next time, because it's running a little long for me and running out of time. So we'll do one a little bit here. Uh, one is basically like your basic things like, oh, lion, ghoul, death dog, all that stuff. Um, actually, did I do half last time? Yeah, because we talked about all the methods, right? Oh no, that was... One fourth. Okay, maybe I have to do half as well because I don't remember talking about jackal wear and shadows. All right, we'll do half then quick. Um, just to compare some stuff, right? Let's compare black bear as a good basic half creature to show off. AC of eleven, hit points of nineteen, keen smell, multi attack. It makes two attacks, one bite, one with this clause. Plus three to hit for both. At max, I always look at averages of damage. That's the way I've been able to scout things the best. So five plus seven, average of twelve damage. All right, that's our low. That's our commons, right, for the half. What makes something an uncommon? Well, let's compare that to such as Crocodile, right? Another creature. Why is Crocodile better? Well, Crocodile, AC of 12, already a little bit better. Hit points of 19, all right. Crocodile can hold its breath for 15 minutes, great. But here's why. Bite. It is 1d10 plus 2, which is 7, and the target is grappled. Until the grapple ends, the target is restrained. 
Restrained is the key word. Not everything that grapples restrains. So, we'll talk about restrained quick. Restrained. A restrained creature's speed becomes zero. It can't benefit from any bonus or its effects. Attack rolls against the creature have advantage, and the creature's attack rolls have disadvantage. And the creature has, has disadvantage on dexterity saving throws. So, not only are you then grappled if you fail a save or a check or something, but then you are also stuck inside the crocodile and restrained inside. Not everything, like I said, grapples also restrains, so that's where that comes in handy to know that, right? So, target's restrained, so it gets hit with advantage, and it hits with disadvantage. So that's already better than the black bear, right? Usually, if something just deals pure damage, it's usually a common. A basic one of the middle. Okay, you want to hit something? Great. You hit a little harder than average? All right, but you don't get any extra additional fluff to it. That's like the commons, right? That's your ape, your black bear, giant goat. Yeah, no, I don't remember talking about this with you guys. So if I did, I apologize, but I'm going to talk about it a little bit again. Satyr, Scout, Thug, uh, Warhorse, Skeleton, things like that are all like basic run-of-the-mill hitting regular types of creatures. It's funny because Warhorse Skeleton is bad, but the Zombie Ogre is better than regular Ogre, even though it's like dead. So there's something interesting for talk about another time. Um, yeah, Warhorse was better than its Skeleton is what it was, because Warhorse... You get to the warhorse quick. Warhorse was 11 AC and 2d6 bludgeoning and strength save if it runs and tramples 20 feet. Meanwhile, oh, did I flip it around? Was the skeleton? No, the skeleton's only 2d6 plus 4 and it doesn't get the charge, so it's already a lot worse than the regular warhorse itself. I mean, yeah, it's got a little bit more AC, but when you compare 11 to 13 AC, that's not like a huge benefit compared to other things in this, you know? So, now we've looked at Crocodile, right? Dealing extra damage, being able to grapple and restrain somebody, holding them in place, granting advantage. Then we go up to the rares, right? What, what quantifies a rare in this, in this certain situation? Well, let's look at something such as uh, Dark Mantle is a good one, I think, to look at. Because Dark Mantle does some really interesting stuff. So Dark Mantle, AC 11, hit points of 22. Sounds very easy to hit. Uh, but it's got false appearance when it remains motionless. It's indistinguishable from a cave formation. The actions got crush and a darkness aura crush plus five to hit on one creature 1d6 plus three bludgeoning and the dark mantle attaches to the target if the target's a medium or smaller creature and the dark mantle has advantage on the attack roll it attaches by engulfing the target's head and the target is also blinded and unable to breathe while the dark mantle is attached this way so not only is it for damage it's then on the creature's head blinding it suffocating it while attached, the Dark Mantle can attack no other creature except the target, of course, uh, but has advantage on the attack rolls. So not only does it get its self-advantage, it's blinding you, and it's making you not be able to breathe, and there's a whole thing about breathing in D&D, &D, if you're honestly curious. Um, it's your con save is how many minutes you can breathe for. Creature can detach the Dark Mantle by making a successful DC 13 strength check on a certain... Otherwise, the Dark Mantle can detach itself by using 5 feet of its movement for free. But, anyway, so this thing continuously hits, and it blinds. Why is that so important? Well, here's what blinded does. Blinded creature can't see and automatically fails any ability check that requires sights, and attack rolls against the creature have advantage, and the creature's rolls have disadvantage. So not only does this thing, like the crocodile, right? So the crocodile makes it so, if anybody else hits it, it, it has advantage, and it hitting out of the crocodile has disadvantage. But the crocodile itself still hits normally. The dark mantle hits, gets advantage, Gives everybody else a, uh, for his future attacks, as long as it's attached to you. Gets, gives you and your friends advantage, like we said, right? And gives the creature attacking out disadvantage. And the creature disadvantage on any checks using the sight that it needs to see if you do. Otherwise, it could walk or hurt themselves. And they have to, as an action, right, make a successful DC's 13 strength check as an action to remove you. Let's say you don't make that. You then lost a turn, and this thing gets advantage to hit you, and everybody else is getting advantage to hit you, and you have disadvantage to hit them. <sighs> and that's just Crush. This thing also has another spell called Darkness Aura. A 15-foot radius of magical darkness extends out from the Dark Mantle, moves with it, and spreads around the corners. The darkness lasts as long as the Dark Mantle maintains concentration, up to 10 minutes. Dark vision can't penetrate this darkness, and no natural light can illuminate it if any of the darkness overlaps with an area of light created by the spell, of second level or lower, the spell creating the light is dispelled. 
So, not only can things with dark vision not see through its magical darkness aura that it can use once per day, but still pretty good. Um, and then it gets all this other stuff on top of it. And that's what quantifies a good epic, or uh, rare, right? That is a rare CR one half, or CR half, right? So you're like, all right, Ryan, all right, I see where, you, I see where you're at. Explain me now these epics and legendaries. I've heard of this jackalware. Why is this a legendary? I'll go to the epics first, right? Dust method. Something to keep in mind, too, with the Dark Mantle, right, is, um, again, it's AC's 11. It's hit points 22. I know I was talking about it a lot, but if you look at stat-wise, it's got no real impressive stats. But its abilities are, like, pretty stellar. That's why it's a rare. Let's look at the Dust method for Epic, shall we? I also gave the Epic, again, there were methods again with Magma and Dust and Dark. Or Magma, Dust, and um, Ice were the three with this tier. I'll go into Dust, because obviously that's an Epic higher level one. Dust method. AC of 12, hit points of 17. Death Burst. When it dies, it explodes in a burst of dust. Each creature within 5 feet must succeed on DC 10 con saving throw or be blinded for 1 minute. A blinded creature can repeat the saving throw. Oh, it can immediately cast sleep, requiring no material components. Alright, that's really good. Obviously, if you're able to cast a spell for free once per day through your creature, you don't have to carry the card in your deck. Or do you win? Let's say it's a spell you can't cast, because you're in a class that doesn't use sleep. You can with the creature. Right, so that's another way to get around certain spell limitations. Uh, so sleep is very strong. Sleep puts people, obviously, to sleep, which then lets other people have advantage if you're knocked down and incapacitated for the time being. Uh, claws, it is 1d4 plus 2 slashing, which is not great, but it can also blinding breath as a recharge 6. Method excels a 15-foot cone of blinding dust. Each creature in the area must make it succeed on DC 10 thing or be blinded for one minute. Again, death burst. Blinded for one minute. Not until the next turn. Not until the Mephit's next turn. For an entire minute. That is 10 rounds of combat, right? Again, a creature can repeat a saving throw at the end of each turn, ending the effect on uh, success. Okay. One is a con save for death burst. One is a dex save for the breath attack. But, and repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns. So it has a chance to break away, right? But if they do not, look, meaning this gives them a chance to break away. It's not like the other creatures early on that the ability simply says until this thing's next turn or until the end of their next turn, right? They have to make a save to try to break out. We're not at that top tier where it's a full minute of just no checks. That's it. But we're at the next improved tier of creatures. You gotta understand, I've been looking at a lot of these creatures in D&D trying to set this up. Seeing comparing this to creatures that automatically just stop their effects the next turn or stop their condition is huge. We went over blinded, right? Blinded for condition here. Attack rolls against you have advantage, and the creature's attack rolls have disadvantage, and they fail any ability checks that requires them to see. So, right, each creature within five feet, if it gets blinded with the death burst or breath attack, it becomes blinded, and has to make the save for a solid minute. It will keep making these saves. If it can't make the checks, it continues to suffer, and has disadvantage on its attack rolls, and everybody hitting it has advantage. Very, very strong, indeed. Okay. So, continuing on here. That's why that's an epic, right? Because that thing just makes up be blinded. Oh, and it puts people to sleep, which is in incapacitating people. I mean, yes, it uses the things with lesser hit points until it reaches things with a lot of more hit points for sleep. But anyway, it is, this is why this is like an epic, because of those reasons. Um, later on, it becomes pretty clear it becomes an epic or legendary. Basically, what it's resistance to and its vulnerabilities and its AC are big, big contributors. That's Dust Method, Deep Gnome. Another epic I'll talk about quick. Deep Gnome here. Uh, AC of 15, hit points of 16. Gnome can cast Blur, Disguise Self, Blindness or Deafness, and then Non-Detection. Most, uh, most of those are one day each, Non-Detection, Self only. But, and also Gnome gets advantages to a bunch of things. So it has advantage on Intelligence, Wisdom, Charisma, Saving Throws Against Magic. Advantage on Dexterity Self Checks, Made to Hide in Rocky Terrain. Spellcasting DC is intelligence. Anyway, but it's also attacks. War pick, which is a D8 plus 2 piercing, and poison dart. So this thing can cast blur or disguise itself, and then could be able to use blur poison dart, right? Which is 30 to 120 feet with a plus 4 to hit. Hit a creature, 1D4 plus 2 piercing. Alright. Target must succeed on DC 12 con saving throw or be poisoned for 1 minute. Target can repeat the saving throw at the end of each turn, ending the effect. We've talked about how good poison is. A poison creature has disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks, and the gnome makes himself harder to hit with blur, or cast blindness or deafness, or disguises himself as something else. 
and then proceeds to poison archer with advantage. Now you have disadvantage on your attacks and ability checks. Yes, disadvantage on tech rolls and, and any ability check. So you have to keep making con ability checks or say con saving throws, excuse me, con saving throws to break away. It's not the easiest thing to do if you're also doing that instead of fighting and yeah, see this is a repeat at the end of his turn. So because of its its AC of being 15, higher up than a lot of the other things that I have, in all honesty, finest and deafness, that's why this thing's only an epic and not a legendary. And then Magmin. Anything with fire is always a really interesting creature to see. So Magmin. Uh, AC 14 at points of 9. Uh, here it is. Resistance to bludging, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attack. I think that's one of the first things I think we see that has this ability. So, not magic attack. Not a lot of things are magical at all. I think there's only one thing, and that's the gift that we'll get to later on. Maybe not this, but the next thing that later on has powers to make its unarmored strikes magic. That's huge, because a lot of things resist magic attacks. Uh, when the magman dies, it... Uh, burst of fire. Each creature within 10 feet of it must make a DC 11 dex saving throw, taking 2d6 fire damage on a failed save or half as much damage on a successful one. Flammable objects that aren't being worn or carried in the area are ignited. Bonus action. It can set itself on fire or extinguish its flames while it's on fire. It sheds bright light in 10 foot radius. When it dies, it deals 2d8. But what is touch? A melee weapon attack. Hit. 2d6 fire damage. If it targets a creature or a flammable object, a creature or a flammable object, it ignites. Until a creature takes an action to douse the fire, they will continue to take 1d6 fire damage at the end of each of its turns. What's important here is, unlike the other creatures, like we talked about, that makes the saves at the end of their turns to break away, this eats up the enemy's entire action. So, it eats up their entire turn, and you get a plus four to hit, which isn't the worst for being CR half. And you continuously deal fire damage, like every turn, right? So you roll to get a four, 2d6, and then the target is a creature flammable object. It just reignites itself. They don't have to make a check for igniting or a check to put it out, but it eats up their action and they're on fire again, <laughs> right? It doesn't say that after they put the fire out, they can't be put on fire again. Oh no, they can keep putting you on fire. And if you don't keep putting it out at the end of, like, if you just choose to ignore it and fight, which you probably should, you're probably going to take around 3d6 fire a turn. Oh, you finally kill this thing after you have disadvantage with hitting, or it's damage it takes its half because it's resistant to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing for non-magical attacks. Oh, you finally kill it. All right, here, take another 2d6 fire damage on a fail save for half as much unsuccessful when I explode and die. So you can see why that's really good, right? Why that's, why that's considered another epic tier. All right, legendary. Hobgoblin, if you guys know D&D, &D, if you fought a Hobgoblin, it's pretty self-explanatory. Already, AC 18. Even that alone just warrants to be legendary. But once returned, the Hobgoblin can deal an extra 2d6 damage to a creature it hit with a weapon attack. If the creature's within 5 feet of an ally of the Hobgoblin that isn't incapacitated. Well, if you're playing with a group of players, chances are your hobgoblin might also be working with your other buddy's other creature attacking one thing. So he gets a deal, probably an extra 2d6. Yep. And what does he hit with? A longsword, uh, 5 feet, plus 3 to hit, 1d8, plus 1 slashing, or 1d10 if used with two hands. So on average, it deals an extra 7 damage, which is 2d6 average, right? And if you're two-handing a weapon, it can also deal 6. So 13 damage. Oh yeah, and I have an AC of 18. With that hand one shield. Obviously, if you're two-handing it, you drop the shield. If you're one-handing it, it, you have an average of 7 plus 5, which is 12. But an AC of 18 is so strong early game. Oh, it's so strong. Not many things can hit you. <laughs> so, but despite your attack not being the strongest attack, not many things can hit you at baseline. So, you're just continuously hitting them for damage, and then it's like, good luck. Now you're fighting a magma and you start on fire, that's a different story. Once you're hit, then you're burning until you put it out. So, different story, right? That's where different things come in handy. Jackal Ware. Alright, this one I thought was really an interesting creature. I've always seen the book, the picture of it in the book. Uh, I've never used a Jackal Ware. I don't know if many of you guys at home have ever used a Jackal Ware. But, I'll get this up here. Jackal Ware here. I think it's Jackalware, right? Jackalware. Jackalware, yep. 
There it is. She said it first. AC of 12, hit points of 18, damage immunities, and this is even better, right? Because suddenly could be magical attack like the Gith, but damage immunity to bludging, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks that aren't silvered. So, now we gotta find something that has a silvered attack? And of course, not magic, obviously. But, not many wild creatures have silvered weapons, if we're being honest. Shape Changer can use action to polymorph into a specific medium humanoid or jackal human hybrid, or back into its true form, that of a small jackal. Other than its size, the statistics are the same in each form. Any equipment's wearing or carrying isn't transformed, it reverts to its true form if it dies. Uh, keen hearing and smell has advantage on any attack roll against a creature. Is one of the wolf's allies. So, advantage on hitting with pack tactics. If it's in the jackal or hybrid form, it can bite, which is 1d4 plus 2 piercing. Scimitar, which is plus 4 to hit, 1d6 plus 2 slashing. Pretty basic stuff. But, has another ability called Sleep Gaze. And this is what I felt warranted for it to be a legendary. I'm pretty sure after talking with a bunch of people, they, they kind of agreed. I might lower it to an epic. We'll see. Here's how Sleep Gaze sounds. Jack aware gazes at one creature can see within 30 feet of it. Forget about being next to it. I'm looking at you. You're looking at me. Sleep Gaze. Argon makes a DC 10 Wisdom Saving Throw. Oh, Wisdom Saving Throw, you say? Well, a lot of things early game have really have either a plus zero or lower on wisdom. Not a lot of things are super wise, so I think that be a 10 is nothing too impressive. On a failed save, the target succumbs to a magical slumber, falling unconscious for 10 minutes, or until someone uses an action to shake the target awake. A creature that successfully saves against the effect is immune to the jackal wear for the next 24 hours. Undead and creatures immune to being charmed aren't affected. Well, unconscious, you are incapacitated, you can't move or speak, unaware of your surroundings, you drop whatever you're holding, you automatically fail strength and deck saving throws, attack rolls against you have advantage, any attack that hits the creature is a critical hit if the attacker is within 5 feet of the creature. And you are considered, what was it, unconscious, incapacitated. You're also incapacitated, which is, you cannot take actions or reactions. The kicker, too, about this, besides people getting advantage and critical hits on you if you're sleeping, or until somebody uses an action to shake the target awake. Well, from my understanding of reading this, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. If I'm going to, you're sleep, I put my jack aware, put your creature to sleep. My team now comes up. We have advantage on hitting you. We have crits if we're within five feet and hitting you. And if we hit you, I believe it doesn't wake you up because it says you can only be waken up by an action to shake the target awake. So somebody else has to give up their turn to wake you up from sleeping. That to me sounds so huge, right? Because according to what this says, other things say if they're sleeping, if they get attacked or shaken awake. This doesn't say that. This says uses an action to shake the target awake. So I could pull up my great sword, technically slam down into you with my creature that's a knight or something, slash into you, and you're not going to wake up because you're magically put to sleep. Oh, I got a crit if I'm within five feet. And oh, I had advantage. All right. Goodbye, person that was just put to sleep because they failed a DC 10 wisdom saving throw. So you see how that's pretty darn good. That to me just made the thing. I was like, all right, you put anything to sleep. You put that hobgoblin to sleep and we just keep wailing on it for 10 turns. And you have, well, not, excuse me, not 10 turns, 10 minutes. So what is it? It's 10 turns is a minute because each turn is six seconds. So if in a hundred turns, we don't knock out your hobgoblin for this AC of 18, something's wrong with us, right? And that's what made this thing seem so good. Now, obviously, you save on the wisdom save. The thing is not that good because you ultimately need to get that bonus. But if you do, that to me sounded like such a game-breaking thing to give the Jack aware that it just was good and seemed super strong. So. And then the shadow, obviously the shadow, I'm pretty sure they just drain strength from people, but that adds up, right? Oh uh, yeah, it's resistant, okay. It's resistant to acid, cold, fire, lightning, thunder, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks. It's immune to necrotic and poison. It can't be a condition immunity because it's literally like a, a ghost, like a shadow, right? AC of 12, hit points of 16. 
While in Sunlight, the Shadow's disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks and saving throws, so Sunlight's not your biggest friend, but its attack is Strength Drain, which is a plus 4 to hit, reach of 5 feet, hit of 2d6 necrotic damage, and the target strength score is reduced by 1d4. Target dies if this reduces the target dies if it reduces the strength to zero. Otherwise, the reduction lasts until the target finishes a short or long rest. If a non-evil humanoid dies from this attack, a new shadow rises from the corpse one d four hours. So, this thing can instantly kill you if your strength is reduced to zero. Now, if you summon this as a player, maybe it's not the strongest thing for you. But it has slashing and piercing and bludgeoning resistance, resistance to acid, cold, fire, lightning, thunder, all that stuff. So you're taking half damage. As you keep attacking people, you have plus 4 to hit, you deal 2d6 necrotic, and the strength score is reduced by 1d4. That is pretty good, especially if it takes you a few turns to knock this thing out, because it's got resistance to a bunch of these things. So, if it just reduces your strength to zero, your creature just dies. Forget about needing to run out of life points or getting healed by a Celestial or anything like that. Your strength is knocked down to zero. You are dead. A lot of things early game don't have a ton of strength. Some stuff do. Obviously, power likes things that do, but not every class does. For example, I flip to the goblin. has a strength of eight. 3d4's average is around eight-ish, seven or eight, right? So... Within three turns, you can just instantly kill the goblin if you don't kill it. Yep. With a strength drain, so pretty good. Now, what makes this scary, and you're like, why is this legendary? Uh, this is a thing where if this is in groups, oh no! Because if all three of the, uh, the DMs summons a bunch of shadows to fight you guys as you're in this dungeon exploring through Oromon, and they all decide to gang up on one of your creatures, and if that creature fails three times, that thing's losing 3d4 strength. That creature might just instantly die, even if they can't touch it and hurt it with necrotic damage so much. And they just go from you to you to you. Or they go and they try attacking the player! And you guys as players might run out of strength and just eventually die that way. That's really scary. So I think anything that can instantly kill something, I think, is warrant of the legendary status as well. So, Alright, that was Sierra Half. I think next time I'll pick it up with doing one, two, and maybe even three. It depends on where I get with things. But uh, spells are done. That was the big thing I wanted to get off. Spells are done. We started doing some of these creature layouts. If you want to come catch me on stream on Twitch, I'm on Twitch and this YouTube channel. If you're watching on YouTube, I also stream on there. You can come check out those live things. Make sure that you're subscribed if you're on YouTube so you get the hit the little bell so you get notification when something goes up. If you are on YouTube and you're listening on another platform, be sure to heart this if you're on iTunes, things like that. And be sure to share this with people so we can help build a good community. And like I said before, if you want to donate and get your name in the book, and or just help me support on Twitch, that also helps get your name in the book. If you're constantly always there giving me feedback, like helping with things. Um, Patreon up in the corner, as you've seen, um, flashing by my head. Uh, down in the description will be the link to that. You can check that out. Your name will obviously be in the book, too, if you want. You know, I, I would never force anybody. I always ask the person if you're comfortable with having your name in the book. Other people aren't, which is totally cool. But you help support this great project and help get art for it. So with that being said, um, thanks for catching this week. Hopefully next week we can get into just purely organized creature chaos and have some good time. And hopefully maybe after that, once I get all the creatures organized, then we start working on building stat blocks. And that's where I really need people to come to the streams to help me support, think of ideas, think of like abilities and cool things to make a creature unique in its own way for this project. So with that being said, thank you all for coming tonight and or today, whatever it is for you. And with that being said, if it's nighttime, have a good night for you. If it's a good day, have a good day for you. And with that, I will catch you guys all for the next one. All right. See ya.